Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, hey, how you doing? Hopefully you're having a great day and you're ready for some Computer America. So today on the program, second part of the show, anytime allotted, we will be doing computer and technology news where we try to keep you up to date on all of the latest computer and tech, well, news. Uh, but in the first part of the show, as always, dedicated to a guest, and today's guest is the one, the only, of course, Edgewater Wireless. You may recall we had them on the program uh, months and months and months ago, but hey, it's uh, it, it's a topic that's very, very interesting, and I'm looking forward to catching up with them, see how things are going, and really just reiterating everything about uh, you know home Wi-Fi and how maybe some of this technology is going to be revolutionizing what you use at home and hey, you know, fixing fixing some of the problems that are inherent in Wi-Fi because uh yeah, you know, Wi-Fi has been a standard for a long time and we are demanding more and more and more of it uh with no end in sight. So this is something that uh, is desperately needed. So everyone, uh again, welcome into the program. So first things first, computeramerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including today's show notes. You'll find past shows, future shows, you'll find uh articles, reviews. We just put a review up on the uh, up on the website of a Wi-Fi connected security camera uh from Swan. So, hey, if you're looking at uh, getting security cameras, you can check that one out. Uh, very, very good camera. And, of course, the interview that we had with Swan was also very interesting. So check that out, ComputerAmerica.com. Find us on social media, at Computer America. You can find us real easy. And I think that's it. That's, uh, you know, morning announcements. So let's go ahead and uh, get our guest on, get this conversation going, and start talking about, well, Wi-Fi. So as I said before, Edge Water Wireless, and to be more specific, we're going to be talking about, well, uh, well, and, you know, uh, a, a couple of different technologies, but we're going to be talking to Mr. Andrew Scoffell. He is the CEO of the company. And Andrew, welcome on to Computer America. How are you doing? Great, Ben. Thank, thanks very much for having me back. Uh, our, hey, our pleasure, our pleasure. Looking forward to this. And yeah, there's... Um, this is a topic that, as I said before, you know, Wi-Fi, I think, is in every single, like, well, obviously I'm a little biased. Wi-Fi should be in most homes, if not every single home across the country. And it's uh, it's getting a little crowded out there. Uh, as I just mentioned, you know, we, we have been reviewing a couple of security cameras, uh, more and more Wi-Fi connected things. Uh, this idea that Wi-Fi should just handle everything seamlessly is uh, not quite what the technical specs are up to currently, but hey, we're working on it, and that will be a topic of discussion. So before we get into the particulars, let's get a little bit of background on Edgewater Wireless, how long have they been around, and a little bit of background on yourself. Thanks, Ben. And, you know, at Edgewater, Edgewater Wireless, we make Wi-Fi better. We're a, a disruptive innovator in the $33 billion global residential and enterprise Wi-Fi markets. And we work with equipment manufacturers, service providers, and leading global chip companies with our patented chips, access points, and IP licensing. We are the industry pioneer in the groundbreaking Wi-Fi spectrum slicing technology, which is delivering next generation Wi-Fi today. Uh, we've we've been around. Um, uh, we're a spinoff from a, a military R and D company, mm -hmm. and you know, roughly three years ago, uh, we pivoted the company to focus in on the the tremendous density dynamic that is is facing Wi Fi. Yeah, and and if you could talk just a little bit about the problem, because obviously. Um 
The, the problem, again, is that back in the day, there may have been a couple of computers. Those were primarily the things that were on networks. Uh, and then, of course, phones became connected to networks. Uh, and, of course, I mean, Wi-Fi networks. Um, and now you have general appliances, again, things like security cameras and doorbells. Um, and in the future, hey, uh, I it, it's hard to imagine that, you know, anything that could have a, a Wi-Fi uh, antenna embedded in it won't have one embedded in it. So um, talk about the problem and, you know, why, like, is this a problem that really needs tackling? Is it getting worse? What is the state of uh, over congested Wi-Fi networks. You know, Ben, your your opening is is um, uh, is is pretty pretty amazing. You know, there's over eight billion Wi-Fi devices um, in the world today. Um, Three billion of those shipped over the last year. There's projected mm-hmm. that's projected to reach five billion. So these are these are uh, you know billions with a capital B. Um, whether that's um, uh, smartphones and laptops or uh, the security camera that you've uh, th- that um, uh, you know preceded us, um, those devices have been connecting to Wi-Fi in exactly the same way since 1999, really when when Wi-Fi started, and that connection is is based on um, what's called a single channel radio architecture. Mm-hmm. The same, it's, it's really the same as a single lane road. And it's, a, you know, works tremendous if you've got one car on a single lane road. Right. But in this, this modern world, um, uh, there is traffic everywhere. And the traditional approach to Wi-Fi is quite simply, you know, reached the end of its, end of its life cycle. It's now time to move from a single lane road to a multi-lane highway. And that's, you know, that's what, um, uh, what we've been focused on and, and what we call Wi-Fi spectrum slicing. Mm-hmm. And that's taking the Wi-Fi spectrum, and slicing it up so you can fit more lanes, handle the enormous amount of traffic and the enormous number of devices that are out there today. And, and of course, there's another technology we're going to be talking about, which is dual channel Wi-Fi as well. Uh, but but this the spectrum slicing, uh, you you mentioned that Edgewater was a spinoff of you know kind of military R and D. And would you say that this is a problem? You know, not just for of course the home and not just for business and of course you know large venues like stadiums and things like that. Uh, is this something that the military is having to contend with as well? You know, for um, uh, applications everywhere, that density problem is really what what impacts the performance so profoundly. You know, the frustration that um, uh, that you feel when you you try to try to you know log on in an airport or coffee shop, or you know, mm-hmm. if you're watching Netflix at home or gaming at home and you're getting kicked off, that's a that's a universal phenomenon. Whether that's the military or your home or or any number of applications, you know, from a um, a service provider perspective, you know, when we we speak to some of the the largest service providers in the world. And you know, almost forty percent of their customer care calls are Wi-Fi related. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a phenomenal cost burden for the industry, and that's something that we've really focused in on on, on trying to address. You know, how how do you make uh, how do you fix the problem? How do you make Wi-Fi better? So and and so let's uh, let's talk about the spectrum slicing, and then we'll get into kind of dual channel uh, Wi-Fi. But spectrum slicing itself. Um, you, you mentioned it's kind of, uh, you know, splitting each individual lane into multiple lanes that can, of course, go back and forth. Uh, that sounds obvi- uh, obviously, if, if it was super, super easy, uh, the the chip makers would do it. The you know your service like so, like someone would would do it with a a software solution if they could. Uh, and of course, there there are things like prioritizing that happens in a network every single day. Uh, what's different about spectrum slicing? Is it a hardware solution? Is it, um, and why, why is it better than let's say prioritizing? Actually, that's a, that's a great question. You know, a a lot of what, um, uh, what's happened with the traditional approach to Wi-Fi, as you know, traffic has increased as interference has grown. Um, uh, there, there's been a, a real focus on, on trying to fix that single lane highway. 
right? How do you how do you make it you, how do you make it more efficient? Um, prioritization of traffic, you know, is is uh, you know in a single lane road, it's when you pull over and you let the ambulance go by, right? Um, and, you know, that's that's really what what prioritization is about. Now, that's all done on the application level, so a fair ways up the stack. What we're talking about with Wi-Fi spectrum slicing is actually right down on the, the Mac and the fire, the physical layer. So we're actually taking the airwaves and we're using them more efficiently. So we're allowing that ambulance to have their own lane. And we're allowing um, uh, you to have your lane, me to have my lane or uh, whatnot on that, that multi-lane highway. So what we do at Edgewater Wireless is really right at the, the physical layer. And that's where interference takes place. That's where the, the challenge of the traditional approach to Wi-Fi really breaks down. You know, what's going on in the industry is there's been this, this you know, incredible focus on speed. Mm-hmm. You know, speed will fix all of our problems. <laughs> and, you know, like turning up the, the speed limit on a single lane road, it, it's great, you know, if there's no traffic. But if you're dealing with the real world of Wi-Fi, which is, you know, devices that are close to your access point, you know, and that are uncontended, and you, you're pairing um, uh, a, um, uh, you know, a video camera, a surveillance camera, or a doorbell, um, that's at the fringe of the network, those devices by by sheer distance actually travel slower. Mm. And so what this what this really needs to deal with that is um, you, you need those physical lanes or that physical separation of devices that can only be done through Wi-Fi spectrum slicing. I, yeah, and, and, and that definitely makes a lot of sense. Uh, and with that being said, though, there's, and, and of course, there's dual channel Wi-Fi, which you also specialize in. Um, can you also talk about that real quick and, and, you know, how that relates to spectrum slicing? Yeah, dual channel Wi-Fi is probably one of the most exciting developments in the in the Wi-Fi industry um, since you know, since 1999. Um, you know what dual channel Wi-Fi does is it it's really designed to resolve issues of let's say video distribution in the home. So you're a large um, uh, service provider, let's say a, a Comcast or someone like that, and they're trying to take the signal that, that terminates in the box in your basement, and they're trying to put it up to the TV in your in your master bedroom or wherever else in your home. Now, to do that over single channel Wi-Fi means that that precious or latency sensitive video traffic is sharing and contending or fighting with all of the other Wi-Fi traffic. Mm-hmm. So, working closely with with cable labs on this this co innovation project. Um, uh, we um, worked with them on their dual channel Wi-Fi standard. Now, what that's doing is allowing for multiple channels to terminate on a single device. You know, why is that such a big deal? Well, take your take your your video stream. Right. You're connecting to the TV using a standard Wi-Fi connection. And all of the rest of the spectrum is really not used. And what dual channel Wi-Fi allows to happen is it sets up a second or you know one or more channels that are dedicated to um, uh, video traffic, downlink video traffic. So getting that that uncontended video signal to the TV, and that's that essentially you're removing all the latency or delay that makes the traditional solution uh, so unstable and really generates all those you know, 40% of the customer care calls, right? Like that's where that's coming from. So this is a really exciting development. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're really pleased uh, to, to be able to um, uh, co-innovate with, uh, with Cable Labs on this. Yeah, that, and 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 really, that's one of the issues that I was running in with the uh, with the security cameras is that if they don't have a solid enough signal, like a constant enough signal, that can be just as bad as a you know just generally a weak signal because then the video, like we found that uh, it, it was like a 1080p camera, but just by right. being like 80 percent, automatically reduced the video quality down to 720p, which you know you're paying for right. a 1080p camera, uh, but you're not getting that, so. 
That's, you know, that, that's, that's actually a, a, a really um, a telling observation. And, you know, speculating on what's happening there is that connection, instead of connecting at, um, at an appropriate data rate because of the distance or because of the, the interference in the area, mm-hmm. it's connecting at a slower data rate and contending with other traffic, which means your, your signal decays. So imagine trying to, trying to get a 4K video stream to your big flat screen TV somewhere. You know, that's where, where dual channel Wi-Fi um, is such an exciting, you know, exciting application. Or, or maybe going to your, your, uh, your, your gaming console, your, you know, your, your PS4 or your, your Xbox or something like that. Right. That's where latency, you know, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a killer, right? Your, your, your gaming yeah. experience just gets disrupted if there's any delay. So this is a really, um, really exciting development in the industry, um, and uh, you know we're we're um, you know we're particularly excited about it because it's the first declaration by a global standards body that you need more than one channel, and that's really right in the wheelhouse of Wi-Fi spectrum slicing and Edgewater. Yeah, and and so uh, you know to to again add one more log to the fire of this whole new technology thing. Uh, many people, hopefully, they've heard by now of, of MIMO, M I M O, multiple input, multiple output. It's uh, it, it's and many routers out there. They they have this technology, you know. They're coming with more and more antennas. Uh, many of them come with arrays that are two by two, four by four, eight by eight. Uh, I think I, I'm I, I think my uh, the one that we use here in the studio is actually a ten by ten. Uh, complete overkill, totally not needed, but it exists. And um, you know that that was another solution to all of the network congestion was just piling like. You know, to use the example of roads, was just a pile. You know, instead of uh, one, you know, one road or two roads, you now have ten roads, and you know they're all just as uh, simple and they work the same way as the singular road did. But at least now you have ten of them. Uh, does that technology affect, replace? Uh, you know, how, how do you react with MIMO? You, you know, this this is a really interesting thing. MIMO is, um, uh, you know, from an engineering perspective, it's um, um, it's pretty cool. Like it's some phenomenally complicated engineering. Now, what um, what MIMO does is you're taking that that same single lane, and you're dividing your your transmission and receipt of the single signals up around multiple antennas. So it's using that same single lane, but you're using more antennas, which the diversity allows you to mm. increase um, and get some performance gains. Now, where MIMO struggles in particular is you you actually need MIMO on both sides. Right? So you need, if you have a 10 by 10 access point, or let's say two by two or four by four, right. your device has to have four, has the matching number of antennas. Now where that, and those antennas have to be spaced far enough apart that you can actually use it. So a laptop is a great place for um, uh, MIMO. Mm-hmm. Now, where it starts to struggle is when you get to smaller devices and or you get to devices that are further away. It's kind of like taking your your two fingers and you hold them apart like this. um, And, you know, if you're close by, you can see that there's space. But if I'm standing out in the parking lot out in front of your studio, (laughs) you can't see that they're apart. So MIMO works. It works very similarly. So this this huge investment in MIMO okay. is 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 also um, has limitations that the FCC, so the the uh, um, uh, uh, regulatory boards and the IEEE put in place. Every time you add an antenna, you cut the power in half. So the effective radius of coverage gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's really designed to increase what we call the burst rate of communications. And the burst rate is is what gets put on the side of the box when you see you know a gigabit 
Wi-Fi connection. Right. Yes, you, you, you can do that. You have to be you know, within uh, a meter or a yard of the access point using a sim- similar number of antennas in a crystal clear environment. But as you add uh, more devices and you have devices that are um, that don't have MIMO, so they're called CISO or single antenna, mm-hmm. um, the, the performance benefits decline. So it, it's, a, it's a very interesting development. And this is why um, uh, you know, what we do does not rely on the fragile nature of MIMO to get performance benefits. We're actually dividing up the the, the physical spectrum and, and putting more lanes in. So, and and thank you for explaining that. That, that definitely makes a lot more sense, um, you know, that, at least to me. And I got to say that uh, the the use case you mentioned, maybe you could replicate that in a laboratory setting, in a in a practical home setting. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're within a meter of your uh, access point, you might also just plug it in Ethernet cord, you know, and, and just do that. That's, that's uh, right. So, yeah. That's, it, that's where a, a classic a classic example of that is your, um, uh, your security camera. Yeah. And, you know, if you, you look at a doorbell security or front door security, that's usually at the fringe of the coverage area. So that's where something like um, Wi-Fi spectrum slicing, where you can give that video stream its uncontended connection, um, is so powerful. Definitely seems like it. And uh, to, to add yet another new technology, uh, this will be the fourth one. Uh, the fourth one, because wireless technology really is going to power, I think, uh, and, and I, I say I think, uh, many, many people much smarter than me have said this is the way of the future. Uh, yeah, wireless technology is going to run our future. We can't have cords running to, as you said, three to five billion devices every single year. Uh, they all have to be wireless. So uh, to to facilitate that, let's talk about how you, and I think last time you were on the show, uh, we mentioned that this complements it, but 5G, 5G cell signal. Um, it's been all the rage at CES. Everything was 5G. Uh, if, if, if you could, right. if you could, if you could uh, somehow take a piece of chewing gum and stick a 5G antenna onto your device, you got a, a CES honoree for innovation. Um, 5G has been everywhere, although it's not been in people's lives. So. Talk about 5G when it finally does make it here. Uh, is that going to completely eclipse everything that we're talking about? Or how is 5G going to, uh, you know, complement what Edgewater is doing? So, you know, 5G is, is a really exciting, transformative development in, in mobile communications, right? Those, um, uh, you know, that, that transition to... Uh, high throughput, low latency, ubiquitous coverage um, that, you know, will help support a a growing number of applications. You know, a lot of things we haven't really thought about yet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we look at how mobile technology has evolved, you know, there was uh, 1G or, or, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G. The step function of change has been relatively minor compared to what is proposed for 5G. Now, what um, uh, what we're seeing in the industry is, you know, 5G is a standard. So it's a, a, like a communication standard. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is not married to a specific technology. So we're seeing 5G have components of traditional cellular um, frequencies, some millimeter wave frequencies, and Wi-Fi playing a real, um, uh, you know, foundational role in 5G. A lot of what we deliver today with Wi-Fi mm-hmm. will become part of that that 5G ecosystem. And where this gets gets really interesting is, um, uh, you know, some of the work that we've done at the Wireless Broadband Alliance or the WBA. Um, with um, uh, you know fellow members Comcast and Nokia in particular, where we were demonstrating a seamless and secure transition from the mobile network to Wi-Fi. You know why is that so important? Well, seamless and secure is not just you, um, uh, you know, walking in from uh, your your car to into the house, you know, and looking at a, a video on your phone. 
but this also allows for machine to machine communications. So a lot of the, the applications and the, the, the broad scale, um, Internet of Things applications that are, that are out there. So we see, you know, Edgewater's role in the 5G world as, as very complementary, particularly because we focus on low latency Wi-Fi. That's what Wi-Fi spectrum slicing is, you know, really all, all about. I, yeah, and and of course, uh, so so one's not going to replace the other. In fact, they you know, hey, uh, like you said, mixing technologies, they might actually be utilizing uh, one another to actually do it uh, to actually do this. So with uh, you know, so with all that being said, I'm looking through my notes here. Uh, we have some of the new standards, of course, Wi-Fi six, Wi-Fi uh, seven. I think it, it is coming down the uh, you know, it, I'm sorry, it's coming down the pike. Um, and of course, I'm still a fan of the 802.11ACAX, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, way to say it. But with all that being said, um, have have you been in discussion? You know, because obviously this is something that has to be done kind of on the hardware level. Uh, have you been in discussion with maybe, um, you know, kind of utilizing this in chips? And obviously, you have to be in. If you have any hope of actually getting this out there, you have to be in talk with manufacturers. How easy or hard would you say uh, getting Spectrum Wi-Fi slicing that technology into existing manufacturing processes? Because if it's if it's really, uh, you know, it's like, oh, well, you need to add another, you know, three times as much production to get it in there. They won't do it. Uh, uh, how how hard is That's this right. to actually do it? Well, you know, what we've, what we've focused on is, um, you know, our, our, our core or our core competency is really around, um, uh, you know, the, the interference mitigation that allows us to put in those, those multiple lanes. Everything that we've done upstream from our chipset, we've kept it as open as possible. So, um, uh, you know, for example, our access points, um, which are which are also a reference design for other people to manufacture against, um, use and, and are very tightly integrated to um, the the Linux Open OpenWRT stream, mm -hmm. which allows us to to focus in on the chipset where where the value is and open that up and make it very easy to incorporate our chipsets into other access points or other vendor act access points. And that for us is one of the big, you know, paths for, for growth, right? Is, is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, using the scale and the reach of uh, major residential uh, Wi-Fi manufacturers to get that out there. Now, um, one of the, um, uh, one of the other areas of our business is, you know, we've, we've put extensive work into patenting um, our, our approach and, and in patenting our approach, um, we, we actually package that up and, and we have um, uh, gone down the path of, you know, licensing um, or offering some of our patents and expertise for licensing by other major chip manufacturers. So having another manufacturer <coughs> implement our approach on their chipset. So it, it's, um, uh, it, it, is, it is very easy to implement. Now the other piece that's that's really come up um, when you you talk about um, 802.11 AX or, or Wi-Fi six mm -hmm. is um, and and I don't know whether you notice this as a, a consumer of Wi-Fi, but the price of access points has skyrocketed, hmm. and you know that is is largely due to the fact of the the complicated engineering and processing required for. AX. So we're seeing the access point price climb. And, you know, we're finding ourselves actually very cost competitive with um, um, the, the uh, you know, volume solutions that are on the market today. So it's put us in a pretty unique position. You know that that is very interesting. Like we we've had uh, just recently on the show, uh, we've had uh, Netgear, D Link, um, uh, I want to say something like uh, Cisco, just recently, um, a couple of these in the past. And you know now that you mention it, technology tends to get cheaper, uh, you know, kind of over time. And I you just made me realize that a lot of the router prices that we've talked about on the show, uh, 
yeah, they're actually going up by like $30, $40 every year, you know, $20, $30 every year, as opposed to going down in price over time. And I never really gave that much consideration, but that, that is a trend. Yeah. And, and what, you know, what we see, you know, in, in, in talking to folks in the industry is there's a significant increase in the, the, the build materials or the bomb for, uh, um, for AX access points in particular. And that's you know, because of the additional antennas and because of the phenomenal amount of processing that's required to uh, eke out the, 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 the uh, performance. Uh, yeah, it, it certainly is uh, it certainly is something that uh, people should uh, hope that you know hope that that changed. And, and, and by the way, so a couple of uh, of points that you made there, and I want to say this. Uh, let's see. So the first one was uh, licensing. We just talked to the HDMI organization that makes, uh, of course, the HDMI standard. Uh, they do licensing uh, much in the way that you're talking about. So it's not something completely I've heard of in the industry. Uh, in fact, it's pretty common to have, uh, you know, license the technology out there. Uh, so that's not completely uncommon. And then the other point I wanted to make was open source. And you mentioned it. You mentioned the the open WRT uh, making your. Uh, you know, making your work open source is is much harder than just saying, uh, yeah, it's ours, it's proprietary, we're not going to open this up to any scrutiny whatsoever, and uh, we're definitely not going to open it up to, uh, you know, okay, uh, really open source, um, was it free as in speech, not free as in beer, uh, <laughs> allowing others to build off of it, to utilize it, of course, give proper credit, and, you know, of course, li license the material. Um and, and that kind of thing, but then be able to build their own solutions on top of it. Uh, that's much harder, like I said, than just putting something out there. Why did you, why, why did you decide that was a priority? Um, you know, we're, we really view ourselves as a, a, a disruptive innovator um, uh, to, the, to the global industry. It's a, you know, it's, it's a huge industry, right? There's the 8 billion devices, $33 billion um, uh, market size. Now, um, to get our solution out there and really deliver the benefits to the most, um, uh, you know, the, the global industry, open source actually gives a really strong platform for doing that. Um, and it allows us to to leverage the, um, uh, the 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 tens of thousands of developers um, that are out there developing on these on these platforms. Now, one of the um, uh, the the um, uh, you know just going down that path further, but one of the key developments in the dual channel Wi-Fi standard mm -hmm. is um, that has been uh, that has been mainstreamed into um, uh, into OpenWRT. So now when you download OpenWRT, a certain stream of it, um, uh, it comes standard with the dual channel Wi-Fi uh, feature. And that is, um, as you've indicated, that is a, a significant amount of work. And, you know, really, um, you know, that, that passed the scrutiny of, um, uh, of the, the OpenWRT uh, community to, to do that. So we're really excited about that. Um, and, you know, as that is being done, we um, also have, have launched uh, development kits, you know, powered by our, our Wi-Fi spectrum slicing technology to really unlock the benefits of dual channel Wi-Fi. You know, and just a, a, a subtle nuance in that standard mm -hmm. is it allows for one or more dedicated data channels. So you can have two, you can have three channels, four channels. Really depends what you're trying to do with the uh, with with the application. So that's why we're we're particularly excited about it. Uh, yeah, and it, of course, all of this. If, if it sounds uh, a little over everyone's heads, I, I I want you to kind of give an encapsulating. Like, let's say Edgewater has um, licenses to everyone, and now it it's it is standard everywhere. Everyone is using it. It's great. Um, talk about that world and what that would look like for the end user. Um, in in let's say in home, out in public, in businesses where. Uh, you know, where they might go. And let's just say, even from a business perspective, what, what is the benefit that everyone is going to see? So, 
you know the the one of the key benefits there is when I when I you know look around our our house and um, uh, you know the my my kids are playing on their their gaming platform. I and you know the, the I I only hear about it when it doesn't work or when there's latency. <laughs> so um, my customer complaints in the house will decline, um, and, you know, as the the gaming experience improves. Um, I, I will no longer need to pull a cable through my house to connect my my television. That can all be done wirelessly, very very simply and, and easily. You know, whether that's going direct to the TV or to a set top box, um, you know, even uh, even on an iPad, you know, reducing the latency means your video and your 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 Netflix streaming or your 4K streaming is unpixelated. So within the home, it, it offers a, a significant improvement to um, your your day to day life. For a service provider, whether that's a telco or a cable operator. Uh, it means that, that their phones at the customer care center um, ring less. Mm. So that 40% of that, we bring that number down. And that goes directly to their bottom line. That's a phenomenal cost of, uh, uh, of those customer care calls. You know, when you, when you have to dispatch a, a tech to the house, you know, that's a significant cost for a, for a service provider. And we help reduce that. So in the home, there's, there's a significant improvement, uh, there and in business. You know, a lot of what's being done in, um, you know, retail applications, you know, streaming advertising to, uh, to screen throughout stores or in venues and things, being able to do that reliably and wirelessly really takes the service to the next level. Uh, yeah, and and obviously forty percent less people calling. Uh, you know, take it from the other pr- perspective. That's forty percent less of us that are having to make those calls, and they can just <laughs> relax and enjoy. So, with all that being said, and of course, you know, there there's some um, you know things like uh, what we're showing on screen here, where this is the you know Wi-Fi Wi-Fi spectrum slicing uh, visuals and graphics. We're going to include that in the show notes if anyone would like kind of a visual of what it is that we've explained a couple of times here on the air. Um, very, very helpful. And we'll, again, throw that in the show notes. Um, and then, of course, your website in general. And I'm going to, you know, kind of let you have, um, you know, uh, one more chance to kind of say, um, is there any area topic that we didn't really discuss that you feel that we should probably touch on? You know, I, I, I think, it, you know, we've done a, uh, done a, a good job on covering off the, the key points of Wi-Fi spectrum slicing, uh, dual channel Wi-Fi, and the, the, the benefits that, um, you know, the, that um, our, our approach delivers to end users and, um, uh, and, and your listeners. Perfect. I appreciate the opportunity to, um, uh, you know, come back on the show. Sir, our, our pleasure, though. I want you to, uh, you know, for any, any listener out there who may be, you know, interested and wants to learn more, where's the best place they can go? Um, if you visit our website, uh, www.edgewaterwireless.com, um, there's a great section there on um, uh, Wi-Fi spectrum slicing. And then there's a series of, uh, of webinars which really go into some of the, the, the key aspects of, uh, of the technology. I'd urge them to go and, uh, go and visit. Oh, perfect. And we'll certainly, again, have links to everything in the show notes. And uh, one more time, uh, everyone, we've been talking to Mr. Andrew Scoffell. He is the CEO of Edgewater Wireless. And uh, Andrew, really, this is, uh, you know, just like last time, this was a very interesting conversation. And I want to thank you so much for joining us. Excellent. Well, thank, thanks for having me, Ben. I appreciate right, the opportunity. So, uh, yeah. So, so here on Computer America, we're going to con- uh, continue with computer technology news. And Andrew, we're going to go ahead and say goodbye. So have a great one. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see you again. All right. So everyone, here we go. Computer and technology news brought to you by Computer America. <laughs> So everyone, uh, I think today on the program, we're going to do computer and technology news. Shocker, I know, but let's go ahead and, uh, and, and talk about this. So obviously a couple things that we could discuss, lots of news stories. And I think today on the program, we're going to start with, well, this one. And it has to do with Germany. Well, Germany and they are banning, well, 
Office 365 in schools, and they are citing privacy concerns. What the heck? So this is uh, coming to us from The Verge, and they're saying that uh, schools in, in Hess uh, in Hess will have to rely on non-cloud software. There you go. Schools in Germany, uh, I'm sorry, schools in the German state house of Hess will no longer be able to use Office 365 thanks to the GDPR rules. Yes, those aren't exactly going away anytime soon. And they also mentioned that uh, the issue arose when Microsoft closed its German data centers in August, creating the potential risk for users' data to be accessed by U.S. authorities. Why is that a problem? Well, GDPR says that uh, any data, I think, has to be housed within the country of origin. So if you want to, let's say you're Microsoft and you want to, let's say, you know, serve Germany, you have to have the infrastructure within Germany itself to be able to provide that service. Uh, by taking the uh, their one server down out of, you know, kind of out of Germany, uh, they then have to rely on using other ones, you know, maybe in other countries and, well, outside of the European Union as well. So they said that a Windows 10 telemetry system collects a wider range of data on products and services, depending on how the privacy settings are configured. And that may include email subject lines, any phrases that the soft, uh, that use Microsoft software to translate. And of course, they also note that Windows 10 telemetry data settings uh, set to enhanced, then that it could also collect contents such as your system memory when crashes occur, which could include sensitive information such as anything you were working on or anything that you were running. So, responding to the news, spokesperson for Microsoft acknowledged the commission's concern, but pointed towards the options administrators already have to limit the amount of data that's collected by default. Uh, I, I think that's that's mainly the issue, and you know that's mainly the issue is that Microsoft knows that when you have an opt-out system, ninety-five percent of the people who use your software are not going to take the time and opt out. Same thing with opt-in. If you have an opt-in system, 95% of the people out there will not take the time to opt-in, and probably even more than that. They also said that the company has recently introduced new features to offer more control over your data, and pointed out that the company has previously successfully sued the US government over access to customer data in Europe. Microsoft trying to make the case that they are for uh, privacy and distinction between the two markets. So they said that we're thankful for the commissioner raised uh, these concerns and we look forward to engaging further with the commissioner on his questions and concerns related to Microsoft's offerings. In the past, Microsoft has attempted to address concerns over the data collection with a Windows Diagnostic Data Viewer that it launched last year. But it seems that the company will need to do more to address the concerns that the Hessian uh, Data Protection Commissioner, he wants more assurance about the security of how the data is processed. Um, you know, good on, good on him. So, so many times we look at these stories and we say, no one's really looking out for the individual's data. Uh, that's up to the individual. That's up to their settings. They have to take it on to themselves. And it's, it's honestly, it's almost like an alien world where a regulatory body in Germany is saying, hey, this might not be best for consumers. Let's take another look at this. As opposed to our current regulatory system, which is, well, uh, legally, they can do anything they want, and that is the prerogative of these. Um, that is the prerogative of these companies. If you would like to, I don't want to say protect yourself from, but if you'd like to limit your interaction with these companies, you have to do that yourself. Good luck, American. Uh, that is such a different solution. So, uh, and I don't want to say it's better, don't want to say it's worse, it's very different. Let's say that. So they said that this problem isn't unique to Microsoft. The commission also notes that uh, they have problem with cloud computing with Google and Apple in GDR compliance. 
Uh, for now, the only option for schools is to use locally stored pieces of software like the non-cloud Office 2019 and unless the company is willing to provide better assurance about data security. Because again, if that data server that was housing all of this was actually in Germany, then Ger you know, then the US would have no authority. The you know, the US government would have no authority to uh, collect the contents of those servers. Uh, but because Office 365 probably at some point runs the data through an American held server, uh, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's open to the U.S. Uh, government scrutiny. So there you go. It's, uh, you know, hey, happens all the time. So there's that one, Germany, very interesting. And like I said, kind of interesting, very interesting. Let's go ahead and talk about... <laughs> well, using big data to combat big data. Check this out. You ever wanted to hire a lawyer? You ever priced one of those things lately? They are incredibly expensive. This one though, not so much. A robot lawyer that you can hire for $3 will sue data brokers that don't delete your personal and location info. Saying that in January, a new law gave consumers the power to stop companies collecting the person, uh, from collecting their personal information. It's known as the California Consumer Privacy Act or CCPA. Can, and it can be a powerful tool for privacy, but it comes with a catch. Consumers who want to exercise their rights must contact every data broker individually. And if you want a little scope on that, and actually there's another story here that you know we're just going to touch on for the sake of this story. You can see here from, you know this is an article from uh, Gizmodo talking about DuckDuckGo, and they've made a list of, well, a list of different companies that actually track you. And you know what? It's huge. Let's see. So if, let's see, I can, so yeah, it's about 1,700 companies, 5,000 domains. So uh, in the difference between domains and companies, domain may be like uh, Gmail and YouTube, two domains, singular company, Google. Uh, so 5,000 different domains, 1,700 companies and of course that's only the ones that they continually update their list on those who actually are big enough to make the list so that's a lot and again going back to the article at hand uh, if you want to be able to um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sorry uh, if you want to be able to create um, let's see yeah, that didn't work. So if you want to be able to have all of them delete everything that, that they know about you, you have to contact every one of those 1,700 companies or 5,000 uh, 5, domains individually. And then on top of that, hey, there's going to be pushback from each individual one because let's face it, if you call up Google and say, hey, uh, I want to delete, I want you to, to delete all the information you have on me, uh, turns out, Google doesn't take phone calls. You got to go through their online submission form. It's really, really difficult. So check this out. A startup called Do Not Pay unveiled a service called, that it calls its digital, well, digital health that automates the data detection. It's right here. And with it, you can fight corporations, beat bureaucracy, find hidden money, sue anyone, automatically cancel your free trials, which a lot, uh, you know, it promises that it can do a lot. And how it actually does it? Well, it's a monthly fee. It gives subscribers access to do not uh, do not pays other automated avenging services like appealing parking tickets in Eddy City, claiming compensation for poor in-flight Wi-Fi, and robot robo revenge, which sues robo callers. Um, this seems to be a service that is much in the vein of what we have talked about in the past. There was a gentleman, I believe, uh, somewhere in the U.S. or the U.K., that actually made a uh, made like a chatbot that would appeal your traffic tickets, your speeding tickets, and things like that. Where you know you would put in all of your all of your information, your first name, your last name, your driver's license, you know the case number, things like that, and then it would handle all of the paperwork. It would file it all by itself, and really 
streamlined the whole process, which was, you know, uh, I think I, if I recall that article, had cleared hundreds of thousands of dollars in, uh, in traffic violations. Which is, which is this weird dynamic, because uh, people are saving lots of money. That's great. You know, this kind of technology has been proven to work. Uh, the flip side is that these, uh, these counties, these municipalities, are losing that money because they are now on the other end of technology. You know, they aren't using technology to simplify the whole process. No, there's another... Um, yeah, there's a, another, um, how do I put this? They're losing money and the technology is making it easier to avoid fines. Um, the solution to that, who knows? And this could be the exact same way. I mean, obviously, if you want to schedule an appointment with the DMV, if you want to smooth any, uh, bah, sue anyone in small claims court, uh, they have jumped the phone queue for any company, cancel any subscription service. Uh, seems too good to be true. I would be very interested. You know, actually, I'm going to bookmark this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to probably get in touch with them and have them on the show. This seems, this seems really interesting. So there you go. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and continue on here. How about we talk about... Okay. Quantum computing been a very popular topic here on the show. Uh, I don't understand it any better than you do, but uh, I've talked with people who do understand it. So, and Google recently claimed that they, uh, that Google had uh, sparked a bit of controversy when Google claimed that they had broken uh, the, the quantum threshold or something like that, where they are able to uh, do something that only a quantum computer would do and that they have achieved True quantum supremacy. I think that was the term that they used. Um, not exactly. And and um, a lot of people took issue with that. So there's another claim out here. And scientists, uh, scientists break Google's quantum algorithm. So as we mentioned, Google is racing to develop quantum enhanced processors that use quantum mechanics effect, uh, effects to reduce speed at which data can be processed. In the near term, Google has devised new, well, uh, yeah, to reduce the speed at which data can be processed. And clearly they mean increase the speed at which data can be processed. Uh, so, and probably reduce the time. So they mentioned that the so-called quantum approximate optimization algorithm uh, is the cornerstone of a modern drive towards noise tolerant quantum enhanced algorithm development. Well, the celebrated approach taken by Google in, uh, in QAOA has sparked vast commercial interest and ignited a global research community to explore novel applications. Of course, the ultimate performance limitations are pretty unknown for, the, for Google's algorithm. And a team of scientists uh, from the Skoltech Deep Quantum Laboratory took up this contemporary challenge, and they said that the all Skoltech team discovered and, quantif uh, yeah, and quantified the, the, uh, what appears to be the fundamental limitation in the widely adopted approach initiated by Google. They said that the findings report a clear limitation of the variational QAOA quantum algorithm and, uh, and other variation quantum algorithms have proven extremely difficult to analyze because the known mathematical techniques due to internal quantum to classical feedback process, essentially saying it's really complicated and it's even more complicated to figure out something really complicated uh, in terms of something that is not so complicated. They said that namely a given quantum combination can only run for a fixed amount of time inside the fixed time, a fixed number of quantum operations can be executed. And they seek to utilize these quantum operations iter uh, yeah, uh, operations here we go, Iter uh, iteratively, wow, that was really hard, by forming a sequence of increasingly optimal approximations to minimize an objective function, saying that the study places new limits on this process. They discover problematic instances of high density with optimal solutions that can be approximated with guaranteed success regardless of the algorithm's runtime. So there you go. 
Uh, looks like they they analyzed it and they have a little nifty little chart here. Uh, essentially, what they're saying is that if I'm understanding this correctly, they're able. Or, there are certain times when you have high density at a pro it, and uh, in those times of high density, it gives you approximations, but there's a maximum amount that you can actually have within that set of period of time. And if it exceeds that, then you completely break the algorithm. Uh, now the challenge is, of course, to uh, widen that and increase that number so that, you know, there is no upper limit to the amount of, uh, to the amount of iterative computations you can run within that set period of time. Pretty interesting. And it's always fun whenever, you know, the industry standard like that kind of changes and evolves. So with, uh, with that being said, let's see, let's see, let's go ahead and continue on here. Uh, let's see. So any story that, uh, we have time for one more quick story if we'd like. Um, okay. How about, man, uh, you know, not even that one. I, I really apologize, folks. I thought I had, a, you know, that one would take, take it out. But, uh, man, I'm so good at explaining quantum computers. That could be it. Uh, how about this one for, uh, about Intel? Researchers discover that Intel chips have an unfixable security flaw, and I'm pretty interested because this is actually, um, this was already known. In 2018, they faced heavy criticism over the, uh, over the meltdown inspector flaws in Intel chips that could have allowed attackers to steal data. That was a way that the processor kind of loaded some of its calculations into its, uh, you know, into a higher process so that uh, it was even higher than um, than the security features. So you could, you know, kind of like take the memory that it, it was that it was kind of predicting and you could read that. And of course, you could pull things from it. Uh, it was not exactly a very good, uh, you know, kind of flaw, but um, it was a flaw. So it looks like there's another one. They said it's difficult to exploit, but it's completely unpatchable. The vulnerability is with Intel's Converge Security and Management Engine, a part of the chip that controls the system boot up power levels firmware and most critically cryptographic function. So security specialists and uh, let's see. Sorry about that. Security specialist positive technologies have found that a tiny gap in security in the module that could allow attackers to inject malicious code and eventually commandeer your PC. So they mentioned that uh, it has its own 486 based CPU, RAM, and boot ROM is the first thing that runs when you boot up your computer. One of the first things that it does to is protect its own memory, but before that happens, there's a brief moment when it's vulnerable. If, a ha if hackers have local or physical access to a machine, they might be able to fire off a DMA transfer to that RAM, overwriting it and hijacking code execution. They said that uh, the, C the CSME's security function allowed the operating system to uh, and apps to secure store uh, to securely store file encryption keys using master chipset key. Uh, if the attacker could access that key by executing malicious code, they can gain access to everything and do potentially serious damage. Uh, it's not platform specific. It's anything to do with Intel. And well, it's pretty hard though. The vulnerability applies to machines with Intel chips built over the last five years or so. And they said that uh, the chip giant told Ars Technica on background that those uh, updates should mitigate local attacks. However, the physical attacks might still be possible if attackers can roll back the BIOS. You know, overall, and this seems to be a lot of what security researchers are doing. And I really, you know, I really don't blame them. This is kind of their, their job is to make headlines and make these assertions. Uh, I completely get it. And when they say that, hey, every Intel chip over the past five years is vulnerable to hacking, great headline. When it comes right down to it, um, if they already have your computer, and they're tech savvy enough to execute one of these that uh, only until recently 
was found in a laboratory setting. And of course, now it's been published, so it might be a little bit easier, but still, um, it's going to be easier just to, you know, kind of do anything else to get into your system rather than roll back the BIOS, uh, inject malware, and get the system keys, blah, 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 for something that probably isn't even that interesting. So, everyone, that's it for us. Thank you for tuning in to Computer America. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Everyone, have a great one. Bye-bye.